Hello and welcome to the Soil Health Hub podcast. In each episode, we invite key industry experts and farmers to explore and debate challenges, opportunities and innovations around soil health and its implications on farming. Tune in and listen to the Soil Health Discussion with your host, Rob Ward. Welcome, my name is Rob Ward and this is the first of what will be many podcasts all about soil health. The people we'll be interviewing will be the real people on the farm that are making the decisions day to day. And I want to know what those decisions are and the challenges they're overcoming. We want practical solutions of how to improve our soil. And to get us going is Jake Freestone. Jake Freestone is the farm manager for Overbury Enterprises. It's a 1600 hectare mixed farm in the beautiful rolling hills of Gloucestershire and Worcestershire in England. He's a leaf accredited farmer and a Nuffield scholar. In 2014, he won Progressive Farmer of the Year by the Farm Business Awards. In 2020, he was Soil Farmer of the Year by the Carbon Toolkit. He's a farmer advisor as well as being the farm manager for Overbury for the Cool Farm Alliance. Jake regularly writes blogs and does podcasts and videos all about the subjects around soil health. The links to those will be in the notes. We look forward to your feedback and here is the podcast. Enjoy. Hi, Jake. Uh, Welcome to the Soil Health Hub. Um, And how are you today? Rob, I'm very well indeed, thank you, and uh, it's great to be here, and um, thank you very much for uh, asking me to come and uh, answer a few questions for you. It's a pleasure. Firstly, congratulations on your achievement um, as the uh, the Soil Farmer of the, of the Year. Talk, talk me through what it felt like when you got that. Uh, I, I was really chuffed, actually. Uh, it was, it's been a combination of a, of a journey that we are, we're not even starting really but it feels like that we've been on it for the last seven or eight years um, and trying to push the agenda of more sustainable farming more regenerative farming um, which it focuses around the health of the soil um, to try and push that into into people's awareness and up the political agenda and and the farming agenda as well that's great let me ask you some some more detailed questions around that the soil health hub is about real stuff for real farmers um yes it's forward thinking and the future of how we are going to approach this challenge but it is about real outcomes and real um situations that ultimately lead to a viable future for this um that that's very important for us at the soil health hub so what does soil health mean to you jake that's a really good question and it (laughs) means my opinion and my view on it changes the more i learn about it um, so if I go back to my sort of the start of my farming career, and so certainly when I came here to Overbury in 2003, uh, we were we were ploughing all the farm, um, and we gradually moved away to a, a minimal cultivation scenario, partly based on economics. To be honest, how can we reduce our cost of production by trying to do less less to the fields, use less diesel, um, be more efficient, cover more acres with fewer men, fewer machines, um, and and then that sort of carried on that thinking right through till about 2011. Um, And then we were starting then to to really scratch till. So we were just looking at some of our very thin soils. We've got uh, Cotswold Brash, which is a a very thin soil over limestone. Um, And we were sort of constantly ploughing up big rocks and cultivating them up. And it was, you know, evident that that's, you know, degrading the, the soil and the fields and, you know, breaking equipment at the end of the day. Um, and we had a really wet autumn in 2012 and we'd started to scratch till um, a few fields then and, and that autumn you could have blindfolded me and taken me to any field and I could have told you how we cultivated that field um, by how far I sank into the, into the mud. Um, and that was a bit of a light bulb moment for me as, as in we need to be able to do this a better way to, to enable our machinery to travel to uh, capture organic matter and keep that in the soil. So it started off with, with healthy soil in terms of, um, you know, not moving it around too much, trying to do a, as little to it as we could get away with uh, once compaction was removed and, and out of the way. So it became a sort of a, a journey, really, of sort of exploration and achievement and wonder as well because you know we're finding things fungi growing in the middle of our fields for instance um mushrooms all over the farm and it's you know that's the sort of stuff that we we never really appreciated or expected 
Um, so to me, the healthy soil, the nub of it now is, is can you get a spade full of it, break it apart and find life in there? Can you find earthworms? Can you open it up and you can smell it and it smells sweet and organic-y, a bit like compost, um, you know, that you would put on your, on your garden. So trying to actually put a measurement on soil health, I think is a, is a really, a really big challenge in terms of putting a number to it. It's more a, more a feeling, I suppose. And, and I think that's where the industry uh, will have challenges going forward. Well, I think, I think that's, that's, a, that's probably why there's been some resistance to it because some of the, the sort of fact-based people don't, don't really see that. They don't need, need really get it if they're in that way because you can't put, they don't like feelings, they like facts. And mm. um, so maybe that's, and also makes it sound a little bit like it's um, idealistic rather than uh, real. So let's focus on the practical side then. You've now moved to a mixed farm, um, really up about on Overbury Enterprises. And um, so how important is that? Before we answer that question, the 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 whole process of intercropping, um, not uh, uh, keeping the soil um, growing something, that that's fascinating. And, it, and it's, it is a total turnaround. And it sounds like that, that you literally did have a, a light bulb moment, um, say, seven years ago, it sounds like thereabouts. And um, the key productivity gains you've seen, um, give me a simple example of cost savings and profitability increases you've had as a result of this type of thinking. I suppose the easiest one that's very straightforward to measure is diesel use. Um, and we have gone from about 52 litres a hectare to establish a crop of wheat down to um, 17 litres if we roll it afterwards. So from, a, from an economic point of view, um, cash going out of the business, that's made some huge savings across the sort of acreage that we're farming. So we're combining about 950 hectares here. We've got another 250 hectares contract farming um, next door. So that's making some significant cash savings. Um, in terms of output and productivity, our wheat yields um, have uh, remained the same. Um, we had a really good year in 2019, highest yield of all the crops across the farm. That's partly weather. We had just the right weather at the right time, but it's also, I think, a combination of, of how we're building organic matter in the soil. Um, organic, having said just now that you can't really measure soil health, one of the indicators is organic matter. And we've moved some organic matters on some of our sand and gravel land fields from 1.1% uh, on based on loss of ignition in 2005 up to just under 3%, 2.98% um, in 2000 and uh, 17, I think we took those tests. So um, we are, you know, we are making changes, but the, the, I think the challenge we have is it's a biological system. Um, so it is influenced by very wet autumns, very wet winters. Um, but, it, you know, in, in terms of profitability, yeah, our costs in terms of machinery replacement are going down. Uh, we've lost 280 horsepower worth of, worth of tractor out of the system. Um, so that's, you know, reduced capital employed in the business uh, that can be used elsewhere. Uh, we're not replacing cultivators uh, and drills. Um, the, the drill we bought was an expensive drill, but it will have a lifespan of probably 20 years here on the farm. Um, so in terms of that uh, recapitalization and reinvestment, we're, we're trying to be as slim as we possibly can. Um, to compete in a very, very difficult marketplace. Do you think then your soil, as a result of this attitude towards focusing on constantly improving the biologicals in the soil, has is protecting you against more extreme weather scenarios? I, I'm, I'm convinced it, it will do. We're, we're on the journey. That you know, wow. last year we had a, such a wet winter followed by a, such a dry spring. And I would love, in a funny kind of way, to have had a field that was still conventional every year to be able to compare. Because I don't think you can just do it on an annual basis. I, I hear and see lots of reports. I, I you know, we we tried a de direct drill last year, um, you know, in the system, and it didn't and it didn't work. But that's sort of one crop in one year, not in. Um, in a whole rotation and a whole shift of everything else you need to do to make the direct drilling work. Things like cover cropping, things like a wider, more diverse rotation, spring crops in there, livestock we mentioned earlier on. So it's 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 part of that whole um, whole approach really. Um, but you know, in terms of organic matter, our limiting factor here in the UK, believe it or not, is still drought. 
um, in terms of wheat yields. So anything we can do to manage water is important. And for me, that is about holding on to it when it's in short supply. Organic matter will do that. And then also sort of shedding it through the through the soil profile um, in periods of excess. And again, organic matter and structure uh, will enable us to do that. And if you look at the predictions of, of climate change, we will be having wetter uh, wetter winters, drier summers, both of which will prove a challenge in growing food uh, in the UK in the future. So yes, we can admit some of that with irrigation, but that will be difficult and expensive. Um, so the next best thing is to improve organic matter. So you've got a bigger sponge to be able to hold that nutrient and the water. It sounds like it's an insurance system, um, but uh, which, which of course you have to be patient to get the right policy. Uh, to make it work. Yeah, I've not, not heard of it like that, um, but, yeah, but, but it, you're right. It's a bit like a bank account as well. I think you have to keep adding to your bank account rather than in a conventional system. If you think of organic matter as your current account, you need to keep topping it up. You, c- you can't keep withdrawing it. Um, and I think that as an industry, we've been guilty of that for very many you know, logical reasons. I, I think we have a, a very temperate climate here. So erosion is a slow process in the UK. We don't have those extremes of you know, dust bowls blowing across prairies, monsoons, and then, and then massive floods uh, that you see in sort of Bangladesh and those sorts of places. So it's happening very slowly. And I think the problem with that is it sort of becomes a bit unnoticed um, you know, oh, there's a bit of, you know, a bit of brown water running down the ditch. Well, you know, it always happens. And actually, it can't always happen because at the end of the day, that's the farmer's asset. That's, you know, it's what your your farm is made of. And that's the bit I really struggle for, for some people to not want to change. Yeah, I'm sure that change is always uh, slow and um, and actually for good reason, because there's a lot of risk in uh, farming and it's about mitigating that risk. I'm just going to go back to the point you made about organic matter. And yes, it, it would be amazing if everybody was doing organic matter calculations every year and, and doing the level of detail you said about that one field that's increased, which is amazing. Um, other characteristics you think are important for measuring soil health? What, what are those? I mean, a, a key indicator, which is really easy for anybody to do, is earthworm counting. Aiming for 16 earthworms in a spade full of soil equates to 400 in a square metre. Um, and that's a very good indicator of... Um, they did some uh, meta-analysis a few years ago, and, and that was, is shown to have an increase in, in productivity, nutrient cycling, draining, aeration, all those sorts of things. So that's a really key one. We're starting to look now in a bit more detail about biological and fungal relationships within the soil. Our soils are, are usually bacterially dominated. Um, because we we constantly, well, historically, we constantly cultivated them. So the fungi didn't have a chance to get themselves established. And then you'd, you'd go through with a, a, a plough or a cultivator and pull all those hyphae apart and, and disrupt that population. Whereas bacteria are, are kind of much faster adapting to that change in environment. So um, our fungal populations are increasing and we're just starting to measure that now, actually. I've, uh, this autumn got hold of a little bit of equipment which we can test on farm, our bacteria and fungi relationships. And we're looking for about a one-to-one relationship of, of was, fungi to bacteria. I was going to ask you, what is your fungal bacteria ratio? And, and I'm not sure many farmers know this or even ask themselves this question, but I, I suspect in five years' time, people will quote their fungal bacteria ratio uh, yeah. as if it's part, as just as important as... Um, I don't know, the nitrogen account they've got in the soil as well. Mm-hmm. And it's interesting from the group, the work we were doing within the Soil Health Hub is, is finding out how much that those that fungal bacteria ratio can affect the nutritional optimization of the soil to help plants be more productive and higher levels of immunity. Have you seen that? Have you seen levels of less need for fungicides, less need for um, using fertilizers? Yeah, I mean, re- you know, really, really good question. And that that's... You know that's the aim. We want to we want to be able to reduce our, our use in fungicides uh, and fertilizer. Nitrogen fertilizer, specifically in terms of its carbon footprint, it, it's massive here in its manufacture and its use and its effect on the organic matter in the soil. You know we're, we're looking hard at how we can uh, improve our nitrogen use um, efficiency, but ultimately reducing overall rates. And we, we've cut it down fifteen percent now um, since we've started along this journey with with not. Uh, an impact on on quality or yield. So, 
that's encouraging, but there's still a long way to go. Um, I'd like to get down to about a 50% cut without affecting um, profitability because, um, you know, although we might not get the same yield, uh, we'll be saving, you know, £100 a hectare of nitrogen fertiliser. Yeah, last, so the last, I guess there's a few inputs we've, we've cut back on. Um, insecticides is one. So we haven't used insecticides on our arable crops um, here for the last four years. That is including oilseed rate, uh, no BYDV spraying for aphids in the autumn. And again, we are we're not seeing uh, we're not seeing detriment in, in not using those products. We haven't been using fungicide seed dressings for the last three years. We treat with um, zinc and manganese, um, but but not a fungicidal seed dressing. And again, we're not seeing any detriment to that. And in fact, we're actually seeing faster plant emergence as well. And that to me is really encouraging. Um, you know, there's an a, a cost saving there, but actually if we're trying to have a more fungally dominated soil, why are we putting a fungicide in the soil next to the seed that wants to have a symbiotic relationship with the fungi that you just killed off? So kind of logically, you, you know, the plants and the soil have, have an inter, integral relationship that, you know, we've sort of interfered with so we're sort of we're sort of rolling the clock back on that it's like you're recruiting a whole army of volunteers to uh, to, to help you uh jake in in farming better these fungal or bacteria guys are there sort of on your side and there to uh, do a lot of the work for you including say if you put uh ag oh, since emphasized ag chems onto the crop to um try and get what you used to get yeah yeah totally yeah. So we took that another stage last last year, actually. We had two four hectare blocks uh, where we treated with biological uh, products instead of fungicides. So we were comparing a, a four spray, fairly traditional farm standard approach versus a, a biological approach. And the although the yield was higher in the farm standard, I think it was off the top of my head, it was 8.3 versus 8.1. So, you know, it was 160, 170 kilos difference which equated to, I think, £27 a hectare more wheat sold. But actually, the margin was um, higher in the biological products because we'd spent £40 less per hectare. So although the numbers aren't, you know, they're not massive, we haven't saved £100, the fact that if we still have this, you know, even if you said that's not statistically different, the fact that we haven't used uh, synthesised products and came up with the same result that has to be a positive, a positive outcome. Oh, and, and I guess um, the the non biological is a one off moment, almost um, a bit like a sticking plaster to stop bleeding. But the uh, biologicals is not only if it's going to benefit in year one, it's also uh, creating more benefits beyond that in, yeah, in subsequent absolutely. years. So, yeah. so it's a, it's it's a preventative um, rather than just a sim just a dealing with the symptom. And I think that that that's very exciting. Um, we're going to do a whole series of uh, work around biological treatments uh, as alternatives. Um, so we'll probably get, peel that back another day. So I look forward to bringing you on that one again. So it's a really great practical stuff there, Jake. And and, and uh, at the same time, uh, you really you know you've hit, you've hit some important elements around the uh, the world we live in, and as opposed to in the climate change area. There's a lot of talk about regenerative agriculture and agroecology. And to the outside world looking in, it doesn't really feel like it's anything specific other than a set of good feelings, like you said. Do, do you think that um, it needs a protocol or a definition? Or, or is this, uh, because I'm thinking as a food branding person from my, my background, that thinking, well, are we, are we missing a trick here? Because um, are, are we, you know, in the States, we started to see some um, pro products be branded around the regenerative farming system, but they have a yeah. protocol to back that up. Are we, are we moving in that direction here? Is that a good idea? And um, is the name regenerative agriculture? And I, I struggle with this word, agroecology. So if I struggle saying it, it's not a great start. Um, but, uh, yeah. but but so so, and what is the difference between the two? Regen versus um, agroecology, um, and is is there a difference? Well, I, I'm not sure that there is really. It's all trying to promote a more natural way of farming. I think all the techniques employed in agroecology would fit into regenerative agriculture, and, and vice versa. From from where I sit. Uh, it, it would be fantastic to get a food label or a food brand as uh, regen or nature friendly farming. You know, that's already been been um, collared by somebody. 
but it, it I guess there's, there's two angles to it as well. There, there's the fact that we hope and believe that the food we're growing will be more nutritious in terms of its you know food density, but that will change year on year with climate. And I don't know, and you'll know, Rob, from a food marketing point of view, how you justify that and, and sell that. So that's one side of it. The other side of it, which I do think we can as a as a group of farmers put together is is the the core principles of what we're trying to do so you know move the soil as as little as possible um have a diverse rotation have cover crops you know have livestock in there as well you know livestock are really important in terms of that recycling of nutrients whether that's grazing cover crops or crop residue turning that muck back onto the field um, adding compost um all these all these techniques are all aimed at improving the soil health to grow healthier product, healthier food for people. And I would, you know, I'd love to see, you know, farmers who are farming this way, and it would need accreditation, I think, in due course. I don't, and, and again, then you, you come back to this, well, what do you measure it against? And, and and then people start to think that, well, we need a number because it is then easy to measure against. Your soil must have an organic matter of 4.8%. Well, that's easy on some soils on the fens uh, very difficult on sand and gravel and they might be farming in completely opposing ways but would still tick that box so i think it's it's got to be much more of a holistic approach i mean i've, I've got my leaf badge here on here uh, leaf is really important i think in terms of um integrated pest management and and how we can develop that sustainability in the in the industry obviously they've got a leaf mark I mean, there are challenges but it would be good to it would be very helpful to get to a point where we could brand uh, a green you know a, a green product as as with my food products hat on the 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 only benefit to a protocol to consumers if they understand it and if they don't understand it then then all we've created is bureaucracy and costs so um i i the, and I think it's fair to say there have been some big challenges with other, let's, let's not name them, uh, protocols that have been created for farmers that haven't been valued by the consumers because it's difficult to understand them. You know, everyone's got uh, lives to lead and they don't really want to know the scientific detail of what's going on. And that applies to a, a car manufacturer as well as it applies to yeah. farming. And actually, this comes down to trust, ultimately. So if you can create a trust protocol um, <laughs> and, and, and a name that makes sense instantly to a consumer, then this, yeah. this has got potential. But um, maybe actually if it simply uh, is more profitable because you're using biological treatments and, um, and using a whole range of different cr- cropping systems, integrated pest management, all the, all the different areas that you've already mentioned today, um, and actually simply is good business, good, you know, not, in, not only good for you, your, how you feel about the, the world, but also good business as it makes more money um, or is more sustainable. So it deals with the, as, as we call the soil health is an insurance scheme against climate change. Then, um, then actually maybe that's enough anyway. Um, yeah. But, but crucially, I guess the last part I'd like to touch on <clears throat> is, um, is you mentioned carbon a couple of times do you, do you think carbon sequestration markets are part of this or do you think they are it really good question um i i think there is a huge opportunity for us to be able to um increase the amount of carbon that we have in our soils as in as an industry across the country um, there'll be very few soils I would expect in this country, apart from some grasslands that are at their sort of, if we said peak carbon. And I know that there are people out there looking at how they can offset carbon from other industries and they're looking at agriculture to do this. I think we have a real worry about um, covering the country with trees and taking a lot of land out of production. Ultimately, uh, we have to be able to um, grow uh, food to sustain the population that you know we also waste a lot of food in this country um and and across the world so i think we need to tackle this from as as always it's a complicated argument but it needs to come from various angles but i think fundamentally we still need to have a food industry here in the uk and we need to do that whilst improving our soil carbon um i think there are markets coming along it's really early days yet and again they're all grappling as far as i'm aware of how do you measure it um, how do you measure your soil carbon today? And then how do you measure it and compare it in five years time? 
And I think that's, until we can sort that out, you're into a very much of a, uh, not, not a gentleman's agreement, but a, a, a very much along the lines of, well, if we farm in this way, by not moving the soil, by having cover crops and keeping our fields covered, the science tells us that we will be having an increase in soil carbon within the fields. And I think that is probably the position we need to be at, at the moment to say that we have bought into these ideas. Um, this is what we're doing. The science is backing that up. And yes, let's take some tests. So we test for loss on ignition for organic matter. We also started doing potassium permanganate tests, which is measuring the active carbon in there. Um, we've got this fungi and biological, uh, fungi and bacteria relationship um, test that literally just started this autumn. But all these things, you know, they take four or five years to to show a, an increase or a decline, rather than a, a sort of a, a one year cycle. So it, it it is really quite tricky to be able to do that unless there's some, you know, again we talk about agri tech helping. Uh, unless we can we can use uh, drones and satellite imagery to to measure carbon. And I know people are working on this now measure that now but then actually we've got footage from 5 10 15 years ago well can we run that then through the software program now and and pick up changes from back then i, I don't know whether that's possible but that might be a way to look at it you know what was what was jake doing when he started at overbury in 2003 um and where is he now everything's crossed that we've shown an improvement but you know that's the that's the challenge that i think we face yeah it, it sounds like though um that it's the carbon is your um, almost like the byproduct of um, cre creating a more biological environment. It's the, it's the it's the, it's the it's what happens. But a bit like us, we eat food and then we ha we have to all go to the uh, the lavatory. So yeah. it, it's always it's what it's what comes. It's, and, and yes, it should. And if it stays in the soil, that's good for the world like, from climate change perspective. But it is the biologicals that are driving this and. Um, and that and they are the you know they're, they're they're driving the vehicle and what comes out the back is, is what comes out the back and if we're measuring what comes out the back only we could be missing what's happening and what direction we're going in from a bio, from where the, where it's been driven and, yeah. and, and the feeling we're getting from a lot of very uh, important interesting people is that it, the biologicals are driving this and therefore understanding that is actually going to be the the key area rather than trying to drive the car by looking you turning around and using a mirror to drive forward. Yes. Um, that, so yeah. that seems to be an area of interest. So we're coming to the end now, but I, I'd like to ask you, in, I always want to, uh, um, I'm very grateful for some incredible people I've met in my life. Who are, who are the, and this is industry people, um, you know, aside from your family and, and obviously important people like that. Um, <laughs> yeah. industry, in, industry people that you've met that, that you would almost want to say thank you to and people that are really helped you um, think and uh, in a way that's, that's where you are now you know i've been really lucky um partly from penelope who's my employer here at overbury to enable me to go on my nuffield farming scholarship that was you know that was that was pretty life-changing and how we've how we've turned the farm around here to, to now doing what we're doing um so you know she, she needs a, a huge pat on the back through that organization i, I you know that there's a, a huge number of people but i i think uh, bill ritchie who's down in new zealand who was one of the um designers and creators of the of the no-till drill that we use he his sort of vision of the of the concept if you like of what we're trying to achieve uh, and the implications on the on the soil it, it was was pretty was pretty special uh john pausey actually as well who's an organic farmer in suffolk um who again he'd be fascinating to interview awful lot of knowledge from from the organic sector that we are starting to now employ uh, ourselves andy howard nuffield scholar uh who got me into intercropping four or five years ago um and we're we're cropping all of our oilseed rate with companion cropping um, and that's helped with reduced fertilizers, reduced insecticides, reduced in fungicides. So there's a, yeah, there's a lot of people. So that's just a, a little small gathering of them, really. Fantastic. Um, and as, as an upper scholar myself, I, I couldn't agree with you more. It's been an amazing uh, world internet of people and uh, long may it continue. It's, it's a wonderful, truly wonderful organization. Um, so if you think about applying, apply uh, wherever you are. <laughs> Absolutely, wherever I think, you are. I think, there are. I think there are 12 countries around the world now that are doing them. So Amazing, yeah. or the or the Nuffield International. Um, so, very quickly, your last last question: What is the what's the next for Jake and and uh, Overbury? What's what is the next? What's the thing that you hope to achieve 
in the near future? Single, simple uh, answer, please. Yeah, well, oh, single, single answer. Um, we need more integration of livestock into the into the farming system. We we haven't really talked about that today, but we've got 1,100 ewes. Uh, we need uh, a different type of animal or their animal byproducts um, on the farm to help. Uh, to help reduce our carbon footprint, um, as well as add more diversity to the to the business and uh, business exposure to uh, climate markets and things like that. So um, I think that would probably be the one thing on top of all the other bits that we're, we'd be aiming to look at. Brilliant, Jake. I'm not going to take any more of your time. Congratulations again on being Soil Farmer of the Year. Um, you are an inspiration yourself, so thank you. There's going to be a lot of people who will listen to this. I'm sure that they'll gather some inspiration themselves to take things forward. So well done. It's amazing <laughs> achieving what you've done. And um, we look forward to seeing you again at the next Nuffield Conference uh, in real, hopefully in real next soon. year. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And um, thank you. Absolute pleasure. Thank you for inviting me, Rob. Great to see you. Thank you for listening to the Soil Health Hub podcast. If you'd like to learn more and join us, visit soilhealthhub.com. See you next time.